Uh, it was a, maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, that I was reading something in the Calgary Herald about this lawyer who was kind of a renegade or something like this in Vancouver, who wrote the Vancouver police and said, are you using this device called Stingray? And the Vancouver police neither would confirm nor deny that they had been using it. So I started looking at what this device was, and it kind of shocked me that, uh, that the police could be using this. And basically it's a device that can trick your cell phone into thinking it's connecting to a tower, and then perhaps whoever has this device has access to all the information on your phone, and they may keep it for an indefinite period of time and do who knows what with it. And uh, I've heard allegations from the criminal bar that these, this data is maybe compiled into lists, and that when the police, if they do, actually go get a warrant to do these types of searches, that they may actually mislead the judiciary. Now, this is all accusations, and I don't know if it's true or not, but there is some suspicious this is or suspicion this is happening. So, it was Doug, who's sitting on the end, Doug King, who had made that initial complaint, and has been leading the charge, I think, in Canada, uh, to have these devices dragged into the light so that we can know as individuals when we are being searched and if this is charter compliant. Very important issue. And then uh, I was actually uh, speaking at a conference I was invited to by Sharon. Sharon works with, a, with a, an organization that uh, promotes and advises on privacy issues. And I spoke at a conference that she had organized and I addressed some of Doug's work and uh, it became, through attending her conference, it came to light to me that my focus solely on state intrusion on individual privacy perhaps was a little uh, naive. That there is a sort of interesting collusion and there is something to be worried about with the private sector also collecting data and using it. And uh, so it was an eye opener to me and so I invited her to speak as well. And so I'm quite excited about this panel. And so uh, what we'll do is we'll allow them to make their presentations however they choose, and then we'll open up the floor for questions afterwards. It's actually such an honor and a privilege to lead the things off today. And it makes for a really good start to the year. In fact, it's one of three things that has made this a really good start to what I hope will be a very good year. For the first time in decades, I spent New Year's Eve in Montreal, which, it's Montreal. I'm sorry, Torontonians. <laughs> I was born and raised there, left many years ago. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, one of the best things about being in Montreal, though, was I had a chance to do a reality check, and a good long one, with someone who has been my most trusted advisor for many, many years. Uh, it's a man who, at 88 years old, still has all his marbles and his memory, still goes to work every day, and has lived through some things that, well, hopefully we won't have to live through. He's seen things that a lot of us aren't aware of any longer, things that aren't taught in school and we need to be reminded about. As Mr. Justice Joyal mentioned last night, it's important to have a historical context to understand where we are and where we're going. And I couldn't agree more. The man I'm talking about, he was born just before the Great Depression hit, in the interwar years, when life was changing in significant ways for people around the world, and for a lot of them, not in a good way at all. There was corruption, there was self-interest, there was people turning away from politics because it was ugly, and they were seeing the state amass power into its own hands. They were seeing friends and neighbors being persecuted by that state. And it was unpleasant, it was ugly. There was people chosen for special attention by the authorities, the Stasi, the KGB, who amassed detailed profiles on everybody. Innocent, loyal, traitorous, it didn't matter. They had it all. Neighbors tried to save their own skin by pointing a finger at their neighbors. In their own homes, they tried to deflect attention and they were self-censoring because they didn't know when the authorities would be listening. Their phone could be sitting on the desk 
and they knew that the authorities had the capability of listening. They just didn't know when that might happen. We have the same thing today with modern technology, and it makes me wonder if that's got something to do with why Mark Zuckerberg puts a, a block on the microphone on his laptop and he covers over the camera. And I, I've got to wonder, does he have an Alexa or a Siri in his home listening all the time? Is he going to buy his new daughter an Aristotle? Really, that's what they're calling it. Mattel is bringing out a new personal assistant designed specifically for children. It's to live in their bedrooms with them and grow with them in the most intimate of spaces. Think back to when you were a teenager, though, and what the raging hormones produced. Vile threats, foul language, nasty comments. Imagine if all of that had been recorded by the digital assistant in your room. What the police and the experts would have to say if they listened to those recordings today. But like Cardinal Richelieu said in the 1600s, give me six lines written by the hand of the most honest of men and I will find something in them with which to hang him. 500 years later, nothing's changed. In the 1930s, Germany used IBM technology to catalog an entire population. And that was using punch cards, rudimentary technology compared to what we have today. Today, we have data brokers. We have hundreds of data brokers gathering detailed profiles on every one of us, and we don't even know it. It's a very lucrative industry that's not based in Canada, so all of the information they are gathering is up for sale. And it's available to the authorities. Most of the data brokers are in the States, one of Canada's Five Eyes partners, so it's available whether through official channels or the way that a lot of police do their real work. Hey, Joe, do you have anything on this guy? A bit of disclosure. There's police in the family and lawyers. So I get the benefit of um, picking their brains as well. It's a problem, though, because we like to think that it's somewhere else. It's out there. It doesn't touch us. But with data brokers, it's insidious. So when the kid, your neighbor kid, came over last week to use your computer and just do some research for their high school social science project on, what, AIDS, cancer, homosexuality, those search terms become part of your permanent digital biography. Even though the search terms have nothing whatever to do with you, but now it's associated with you. And every time your information is sorted and sold for pennies per life, that information describes you. It's a problem. Like my advisor said, he was telling me about living through the McCarthy era, when law-abiding American citizens were persecuted by their good government their state. And a lot of it was based on nothing more than law enforcement run amok. A state that gave itself power to investigate people based on false accusations, based on the accusations of others who were trying to deflect attention from themselves. The FBI under J. Edgar Hoover, who had detailed profiles built on Almost everybody, innocent, loyal, traitorous, it didn't matter. Sounds kind of like the Stasi or the KGB, but this was the good old US of A. Half a century later, though, it's happening again. History is repeating itself. Sure, the Berlin Wall came down 25 years ago, and the Cold War ended, but now we have the global cyber war. And we have Bill C-51. And we actually have an awful lot of other laws that invade our privacy 
It makes privacy a fantasy, really and truly. And Bill C-51 allows the police and our state to build detailed profiles on all of us. Innocent, loyal, traitorous, doesn't matter. Of course, actually, it's been like that in Canada for longer than most people realize. Uh, you could say that Bill C-51 is just making legal some of the things that have been going on. And you might ask, how do I know? Well, like my father. Uh, he tells stories. Everything is a story. It gets, there's a point to it, though. I left home, as we all do at some point. I left home many years ago. It was actually the year that Super Bowl, Super Bowl 12 was played. We're about to have 51. It was the year that Microsoft opened its first international office. So I moved away. But I didn't call my mother. I didn't call my folks for a very, very, very long time. But as it turns out, it didn't matter. They knew where I was. They knew what city I was in on the other side of the country. They knew where I worked. They knew who I spoke to. They knew which movie I went to. They knew all about me. And this is before modern technology. This is before desktop computers. This is before fax machines. They knew it all. How? My father went to the phone company and he listened to the recordings of my phone calls. That sort of thing is, we thought, unheard of in Canada. And really, I don't have the imagination to dream these things up. It goes on here. There's another part of it. The no-fly list, when it was introduced after 9-11 to protect us all. And how many Canadians were absolutely outraged that their personal information was going to be sent to the US. It was going to be subject to the Patriot Act. How dare they? But what they didn't realize is that that's been going on for a long time, since Canada introduced the air traffic regulations in 1995, a full 16 years prior to 9-11. Every air carrier that sells a service in Canada under those regulations was obliged to gather and provide what's become known as the passenger name record information. When the regulations were passed, though, there was no mention of where the data could or could not reside. So from day one in 1995, every time your travel agent made your reservation, or more recently, you logged on, your information was sent to the States. And you say, but how could that be? I logged on to WestJet or Porter or Air Canada. It's seamless this wonderfully euphemistic term. As soon as you click to buy your ticket, you're switched over to Sabre. Sabre is the reservation system that our airlines use. Sabre is out of Texas. So all of our information is lodged in the US and available to the US authorities and through that to the other Five Eyes partners. People don't realize it, so they get outraged, perhaps because they're ignorant, not stupid, but just ignorant of how these things happen. And you might say that there's some utility in keeping people ignorant. Agnotology is a great word. The economic impact and advantages to be had from keeping people ignorant. It works in this case. But when it comes to all of this, really, do we have anything to worry about? Because we know the police aren't going to bother people who haven't done something wrong. And it's the police. They have a job to do. They have laws to uphold, and that's great. But we also know from recent reports that CSIS wouldn't do anything that they shouldn't, that the RCMP that's interpreting law and setting their own policies internally to interpret law, they wouldn't do anything illegal 
that the police in Montreal who fudged it, as Derek was alluding to, when they had the warrants issued to be able to track a journalist, they were able to feed whatever they wanted to the JP to get the warrants. Why? Perhaps because the JP, well, I won't say the JP was ignorant of these issues, but perhaps not as well-versed as he ought to be now, to be able to ask the tough questions about what are you looking for? What does this term mean? There's an awful lot of euphemisms in technology that are, are used to bamboozle people, and from the Lagasse case, we can see it works. And it's, it's happened before. You know the Mark McCarthy era that I was talking about? Senator McCarthy didn't have the FBI surveil law-abiding citizens and have them accused and have their accusers accuse people based on false allegations. It was a matter of guilt by association. And now we are guilty by our associations. And maybe it's a matter that the police then in the McCarthy era, they didn't have the sophisticated technology that they needed to pinpoint who's the bad guy and ignore the good guys. That's not the case anymore. They have very sophisticated technology, and Doug's going to talk a little more about just one little piece of it. Which also brings me to the third thing that makes this a really good start to what I hope will be a very, very exciting year. There's renewed focus on the privacy implications of technology. For a while, we would see an occasional report about a privacy breach. They're daily now. We would see a little bit of discussion about some new technology. It helps at CES, the, the electronics show is on this week, so there's announcements of all sorts of wonderful t new technology. Do we really need a hairbrush that monitors as we brush our hair so that we can have the readout on the app on our phone that tells us how we should brush our hair to improve the condition? I'm not kidding. Do we need personal vibrators? Download the app and it'll tell you what. Except it also, there was a personal vibrator that was so insecure that all of the information, use, duration, details, location, that was all out in the wild. This stuff goes on, and it is constant. So it's not just the police in the state. And some would say that, sure, organizations, the big organizations, the Facebooks, the Googles, they're complicit. Well, yes, they all have their government relations and their police relations people, and they do work with the state sometimes. Sometimes, <coughs> like Apple, they push back a bit. But the part that we will never know is when they don't push back. Um, but there's things like social um, media sonar. It's a tool. It's actually from London, Ontario. And it is designed as a tool to help monitor social media for the public good, for a matter of public safety. Sounds tremendous, doesn't it? Except it's come under some scrutiny because apparently um, some police forces have been using it uh, for racial profiling. It's so good, it's such a very good tool at monitoring social media that the police can enter in search terms like hashtag Black Lives Matter, hashtag police brutality. And in that way, they are offering special attention to a very select group of people who are doing what? Expressing their opinion? Really? Like, go after the bad guys. But really, that's only one example of technology. And it's, it's insidious now. Private industry has been innovative. They've created all sorts of wonderful devices and technologies, and we've all bought into it. We've all been told 
This is going to create convenience for you. It's easier, it's less expensive. And really, it's a matter that we've, we're almost nudged into it to know that we have to do this. Not only is it okay to put the minutia of our lives online, it's required because everybody's doing it. We just know that. And we also know, we're told, that if we don't, we'll be the only ones left out. Like being the last kid picked for the dodgeball team. And we don't want that. It's like we're, we're kids in big bodies. So we go along and we download the apps and we do like everybody else and it is convenient. Is it secure? Is it improving security, safety, public safety? Depends who you ask. Does an app for a digital thermometer, it was actually a digital rectal thermometer with an app. Whatever happened to looking at the thermometer, really? <laughs> do you need an app? But the app also required that you allow it to take all of the content from your phone, your contacts, your texts, your photos. Why? Because that's the way these things are designed. They are notoriously unsecure. You see, because the whole time we were being nudged into buying into this, we were being told how righteous it is to give up just a little bit of our privacy and a little bit more of our privacy and a little bit more for the sake of national security, for the sake of the greater good, for the sake of our children. Former Minister Vic Taves, I'm sure those words ring in his ears. But what happened to the promise? And what happened to our privacy? Really, when no one was looking, the search for security was given a really, really great and powerful tool and ally, us. We were nudged into believing it's okay to share our thoughts, our opinions, not in a paper diary that our sibling might see, but online for the world to see. And of course, it's in another country, so it's outside of the protections of our uh, dubious, shall we say, privacy laws. <coughs> we have people taking pictures out in public because everybody's doing it. We're texting, we're taking pictures, we take pictures of people getting arrested, videos of police cars speeding through red lights only to what? Drive into the nearest Tim Hortons. Is it for a bathroom break, a coffee run? A robbery? We'll never know. Why? Because what goes on inside a police department is internal. Everything has to do with investigation. Or like in Calgary when they recently changed the colors of the police cars to go retro, black and white. They also changed the numbers on every car from having them on the side panels about five inches tall dark blue on white. Great contrast, easy to read. They've changed it if you know where to look on the back bumper. It's a nice dull gold color, two inches tall on black, impossible to see at any distance. And when I asked our, our chief of police, Roger Chaffin, about it, I said, you know, it, it, some people might say it looks like you're trying to make it difficult to identify which car blew a red light for no good reason. And he assured me, well, investigation, if you complain to uh, professional standards, it can be investigated using the GPS in the police car. That was reassuring. Not very much, though, because what goes on in a police department is internal. And it's everything from the janitor to the accounting to the most sophisticated investigation has to do with Detecting, suppressing, and there's three things. Detecting, preventing, and suppressing crime. That is what law enforcement is all about. So everything they do, in one way or another, supports that, or can be construed as supporting that. So we will never find out, because to leak or divulge in an access to information request, any real information 
could at some point interfere with police investigation. So that's not going to happen. So where is the accountability? Where is that promise? And why should we care how deeply this goes to undermine our privacy? Really? The big worry used to be kids would watch too much TV or sit too close to the TV. Now, we have TVs that watch us and identify who's in the room. We have facial recognition monitoring all of us as we go through airports. We have smart fridges. And now LG has just announced that everything they produce will be smart. Smart fridges that can put our grocery order in automatically if we wish because it can read the barcode on the prod products that we put in our fridge, but that also means it can read the best before date and report to Child and Family Services that the milk we're keeping in our fridge is stale dated, and we have children you know, so they best investigate for the children. We don't know who the information is shared with, because remember, all the privacy terms from banks to private sector to everybody says we will share the information with our partners and affiliates but they don't say who those are they change we have smart meters monitoring our electricity it's built on GSM technology GSM was all the rage it was novel in 1998 and that's what it's still built on notoriously unsecure and Smart meters can tell, and that information has been used as evidence now, it can tell who is in a dwelling, at what time they are using power, how much power, what appliances are using the power, because every appliance that uses power gives a, a, a very subtle digital signature. So it is trackable and traceable. And when it's all routed through the states, as uh, Chris Parsons and others here at the U of T have proven, again, it's available to, available to all of the Five Eyes partners and out of the protection of Canada and our laws. We have apps that promise to get us healthier. Download the app, it'll check the readout on your Fitbit, it'll compare your social media comments and recalculate your sentiment score, I kid you not, and your sentiment score is now correlated to your credit worthiness. It will check the photos of you jogging and correlate the location, the weather, the terrain. It can distribute all that information. It'll check the sensors in the 150 plus computer systems in your car and distribute that information automatically to car manufacturers and device component manufacturers that are outside of Canada. And that alone is proof positive that the consent model in Canada doesn't work. Privacy is a fantasy here. And the DNA that you paid Ancestry.com to analyze so you'd know if you have a propensity to a particular health problem, that's in the States. That's available to police, to insurance companies, unless and until Bill S-201 actually passes. Um, the, the information, all the conversations in your Ford that has Alexa on board, the selfies in the new Chrysler vehicle that the car takes, it goes on and on. So, all that data that's available to the police, it proves the science fiction future is already here. If we're lucky, it will also apply to the people who are writing the rules and the people, the police, who are enforcing those rules. And maybe, just maybe, realizing that their own privacy is at stake and that the vaguely worded laws that presume we are all enemies of the state until we prove ourselves innocent, when they realize that that affects them and their children, maybe that will help lawmakers develop the political will and the courage to admit that it's time to go beyond the promise that these technologies offer and do it in a way that gains and regains the public trust with laws that require innovation to be designed to actually protect our privacy and clearly worded laws 
very clearly worded laws that enable police to do their job and focus on the bad guys. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is some of the ways that police actually have uh, and are currently employing to try to obtain information about individuals. So my name is Doug King. I'm a lawyer with Pivot Legal Society in Vancouver. Uh, first of all, I really want to thank the CCF for inviting me out here. Um, when I look at the, the roster um, of speakers for the rest of the, today and tomorrow, I have to say I feel I might be a little bit over my head. I'm going to try to do my best. Um, as Derek said, this has been a really fascinating and, and kind of an interesting uh, project for us where we, we developed, I guess, a uh, an approach to privacy and policing that we actually quickly found out we weren't the only ones doing this, but we uncovered a little bit of policing and a, and a piece of policing which changed the, our perception on, on where policing entirely is going uh, in the next century. I did bring a couple slides which are physical kind of portrayals of some of the information, um, the actual equipment that police are using. Maybe in question period I can put a couple of those up just so you can see for yourself what these devices look like. So it was uh, in the spring of 2015 last year where we started first seeing articles arising about this device called the Stingray. And most notably the New York Times wrote an article talking about how uh, a release of information, a criminal prosecution in the United States revealed that police forces in the US were starting to use this device called the Stingray. And I've now worked in police accountability with Pivot for over 10 years and one of the things that I've learned is that Policing philosophies and policing culture in Canada, while it's very distinct from the United States in many, many ways, uh, when it comes to gadgets and technology, it tends to follow the United States' lead. So if you see something arising in the United States, if you see some kind of um, device or weapon, there's a decent chance that you'll find that weapon in Canada in the next five years. And that kind of sparked our interest, and, and it really asked us to raise that question. Well, if this is happening in the United States, is it happening in Canada? So we drafted a freedom of information request, which is a practice that we commonly do in policing cases. Uh, we asked the Vancouver Police Department specifically to respond to us and to tell us whether or not they had a Stingray device, whether or not they'd acquired the device, whether or not they had used the device, and if they had any documents relating to that device. And one of the interesting things that the New York Times reported on was that when the Stingray device was being sold to police departments in the United States, it was being sold under a contract. And that contract had what's called a non-disclosure clause. So that if a police department actually wanted to use the Stingray device, it couldn't reveal the fact that it had done that. Not even in a criminal prosecution, not even to a judge, not even when asked. The, the, the contract was so binding on the individual organization that basically they had to keep it a secret. And that was probably one of the most concerning things about Stingray when it came out, was this notion that police forces were going to engage in using a tool where they actually proactively said we're never going to tell anybody that we're using it because that fundamentally goes against one of the principles of democracy. So our response from the Vancouver Police Department was that they can neither confirm nor deny the existence of the Stingray device. And that response, neither confirming nor denying, is something that's existed for decades now uh, in North America. I think it actually started in the World War II era. But it's, it's basically a way of saying some people would say it's a way of acknowledging that there's something there, but they're not going to give it to us. Uh, and it's, it's actually one of the more common methods used by police agencies to try to withhold information. Um, from the FOIs that we've done with the Vancouver Police Department specifically, we typically get back responses that say, we don't want to give you this information because of third-party privacy interests, or we don't want to give it because, as Sharon said, it will hurt the efficacy of our investigations, or it could damage our ability to continue to investigate and use these tools in the future. The, the problem with that, of course, is that devices like Stingray are not just about surveillance of one person. We've entered an age in technology now where police surveillance isn't targeted anymore. It's broad-based. And the Stingray device itself, from what we gathered, was a device that could be used in a way which could monitor large groups of people over large areas all at once. So to tell you a little bit about what we know now about Stingray. Stingray is essentially a fake cell phone tower. And a lot of you probably have heard about Stingray up to this point now and read a little bit about it. Uh, effectively how it works is that the police deploy it as a device which mimics a cell phone tower. If somebody in that area related to the, the Stingray device where it's deployed connects to their cell phone or has their cell phone on, uh, it has to go through the Stingray device. So typically when we walk around with our phones, our phones are always connected to a cell phone tower. That tower is relaying information. 
Uh, when a stingray is deployed, there's now a second tower in the mix. It has to go to the stingray first, and then it goes to your normal cell phone tower, and there is basically a third party coming into the mix. And the stingray device, the first prototype, was used in a way that uh, it could intercept not just one person's information, but the information of everyone who was connecting to that specific cell phone tower. And it gave the police a back end into people's phones. They could actually go into someone's phone and take information from it. And that included text messages, contacts, everything that you store on your phone. And that was really the, the crux of the problem. Um, while police had the ability to use the Stingray to target one individual and maybe get information, regardless of how they were doing that or who they were targeting, they were always going to be collecting information and data on everybody else in the area who was connecting to the tower. So it wasn't just about these individuals' rights, but it became about the privacy rights of everyone involved. And that's why when we got the response to the Vancouver Police Department, we decided to file a complaint to the Privacy Commissioner of British Columbia. And we, we kind of started to amass our team of people who would support us. We, we got uh, Open Media, which is a nonprofit that's based in, uh, I think, Toronto. We got the British Columbia Civil Liberties Union and a couple privacy experts to join in us and say, it's important for the public good that we have a discussion about these devices. Well, there certainly is an argument that could be made that revealing the fact that these devices' existence will make it harder for the police to surveil people. Um, when we're talking about the public good, this is a, the, the time and the place for us as a society to have these conversations. Uh, we filed this complaint, we went through the process, we did extensive work and research to file submissions, and on the date that the Vancouver Police Department's submissions and reply were due, we received a letter that said, okay, we'll fess up, we'll tell you. And, and what it said was that they do not have the device, that uh, they do not have any intention of obtaining the device in the future, and they have no documents relating to the device. And it was right about this time that we found out that the situation around stingways was actually a lot more complicated than we thought. Uh, there was a project going on in uh, Quebec called Project Clemenza, and it was the first kind of real, I guess, revealing of the use of stingrays in Canada. And it was through the criminal prosecution of some organized crime members that defense counsel was able to obtain that police were using the stingray device. And specifically, the, the RCMP had obtained stingray devices and were using them. And that caused us to, to reapproach the Vancouver Police Department and say, well, you told us that you don't have a device, but what you didn't tell us is whether or not you're using devices from somebody else or you have access to the information that people have obtained. And through that re-reply, we were able to get the Vancouver Police Department to acknowledge that basically the situation in Canada seems to be that the RCMP has been able to obtain stingray devices. They have been deploying those devices in specific situations, and other police departments have access to those devices. So even if your home police department says that they don't have a Stingray device themselves, uh, more than likely they do now have access to it. And the, the Stingray device, while in itself is very troubling, the second version of the Stingray device is now even more powerful than the first. Uh, most recently, I think it was revealed just earlier this week, the Stingray 2 has the ability to mimic four cell phone towers at least at once, which means that there are more people connecting to it. Every different cell phone provider now can be covered. Essentially, there's no escape if the police want to deploy the device. Uh, the Stingray is also just one of many devices that police use. It's, it's a, a piece of the puzzle. Uh, and when you put that puzzle together, you come to the inescapable conclusion that in the very near future, if not the present, the police are going to have the ability and the means to get information about any individual in society that they want through the use of facial technology, facial recognition te technology, as Sharon mentioned, uh, license plate readers on cars, Stingray devices, and another device which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, the, the police basically have the ability to understand where somebody is at any time, uh, information about that person through their personal devices, and as Sharon said, you know, we willingly engage in the private sphere all the time, giving information to private companies, and we always have to ask the question of whether or not police ultimately are gonna have access to that as well. Pretty much, you could argue that the game is up. If the last 20 or 30 years were about police engaging in surveillance, individuals having the ability to either avoid that surveillance or having the option, um, it's not really an option anymore. And that means we have to stop talking about that kind of dynamic and start talking about the new reality, which is that police have the ability to surveil anyone at any time. When should we set the boundaries of how they can do that? And, and how effectively are we going to create the kind of accountability measures and safety measures to prevent really those kind of egregious breaches of privacy that we've already started to see come out. So the second tool 
that, that really is problematic along with Stingray is something called persistent surveillance devices. Uh, and this is another thing that has come out most recently through the American context. So for the last year, in the city of Baltimore in the United States, there has been a, a small aircraft called a Cessna flying around the city every day with a camera on it. And what this camera does is it takes pictures of every part of the city continually, and it relays those pictures down to a station. And, and the idea here is that there's a real-time picture being taken at all times of the city below. And I, I, I'll show you a picture at the end of the talk to give you an idea of kind of what the resolution is. It's, it's not intensely res resolute. You can't tell somebody's face from the picture. But uh, if you look at Google Earth, for example, you can see that kind of level of, of accuracy. And, and the idea around persistent surveillance systems is that you can track an individual, not necessarily in real time because of something they're doing presently, but about something that just happened, you can go back and then look. So the idea of it was, was actually crafted in the Iraq War. And it happened when the United States Army was having consistent problems with explosive devices being deployed against its, its personnel. Uh, they would have an IED explosion happen they would need to try to figure out how it happened and who did it. And the idea around persistent surveillance was if you had a recording going of all times of what was happening, if, if an explosion happened, you could then look at the videotape, target where it happened, and go back in time and see where that person came from. The car that ultimately exploded, where did it come from? Where did it go? And when it stopped at that place, where did it go before? And you start to create a pattern of, of people's behavior and you start to make connections where you can try to prevent these things from happening in the future. And the people who invented this technology and deployed it in Iraq after the war ended thought, well, this is something that could be of use to police forces in the United States back home. Uh, I think in some respects, maybe surprisingly, there was a significant resistance to that. Even though police forces knew they'd probably receive an immediate benefit, there are serious concerns about privacy and how it would be used. And a lot of police departments didn't want to take that plunge. Um, it was in Baltimore, I think, because of the circumstances in the city, but also because they were able to get some financial support to pay for it, they decided they wanted to be the system, the first to try this new system. So that's why I say for the last year, this has actually been used and deployed in Baltimore. Probably in the next few weeks, the first few months of this year, they are going to release a report about how this system has worked and what effect it's had on crime. You can bet that if it's positive results and it's showing to police departments that uh, it has a major effect on crime, more and more police departments, more and more cities are going to jump on board. And the thing about persistent surveillance systems is that it, it raises kind of a new aspect of policing which, which hasn't really been talked about before or really ingrained into our justice system, which is not necessarily that surveillance starts once something happens, once you do something wrong and you catch the attention of police. It's all about surveillance happening all the time and police having the ability after something's happened to go back into the past and see what they want to about you. And, and really what it comes down to is if, if the means are there, if the technology is there for the police to have persistent surveillance, when are they using it? When are they choosing to or how are they using it? You know, in Canada, we do have a safeguard system in place in the justice system where uh, typically if police want to engage in any kind of surveillance, they need to obtain a warrant. And that is really one of the ultimate questions about persistent surveillance. Are we going to create a system where police only need to obtain a warrant or access once specifically they have grounds to, but they can continue to surveil in the background at all times but not access that information? Or are we going to allow them to do that surveillance at all and say, you, you can't actually engage in surveillance until you have reasonable and probable grounds. And whether or not you have judicial authorization to do so, you shouldn't be able to conduct surveillance just in the background and then engage that information. That's a question that's really unresolved right now. And, and it's, it's important when you look at systems like Stingray and when you look at persistent surveillance through aircraft because it does bring everybody into the mix. It's not just about one person and one investigation. And the reality is the information that's gathered in one investigation can then be used in future investigations. So uh, if a stingray is deployed and you happen to be in the catchment area, information is gathered about you, well, sometime in the future, the police might decide, well, we want to take a look at this person too. Let's see what information we have on them. And they can go back in that database. And it was really access to the databases that, that sparked, I think, um, our ultimate question the Vancouver Police Department, which was not necessarily do you have this device, but 
ultimately, can you access the information from this device if it's being used? Um, and that kind of that metadata, those, those large gatherings of information, as Sharon talked about, that we're continually gathering on every single person in the United States and Canada right now, uh, who has access to that and when? And that's really when we talk about um, creating that, that kind of standard or creating that rule, when can police access this information? You know, I think the reality of the situation now is that police are going to be able to gather that information. And even if police are not going to gather that information, as Sharon said, uh, corporations are going to gather it on us. And we're going to willingly give them the ability to do that when we voluntarily sign up to use certain devices and things like that. So if that information is going to exist, if everybody is going to have some kind of electronic profile on them, when can police access it? Well, one of the other things I've learned from doing police accountability over the last years is that if you ask a police officer what constitutes a serious offense, more often than not, they're going to tell you every offense is a serious offense. They don't necessarily share the same kind of analysis on what the average person would say in terms of um, there's a difference in serious offenses between shoplifting versus robbery versus murder. And one of the biggest divergences that we've seen is that if you talk to people about how they value constitutional rights like the right to protest, there's a, there's a large divergence between a lot of people's belief that there's a constitutional right to protest and that right should be protected and the police's belief that protest is really uh, another thing that they have to worry about, it's another nuisance that they have to deal with, and it's another threat that they have to deal with. We've seen far too many examples, especially with, with the G20 in Toronto, um, and most recently with the protests in Vancouver against the Kinder Morgan pipeline. The police have a lot of motivation to engage in surveillance on protesters in a way that probably the general public would not necessarily agree with. But uh, at the end of the day, currently, it's the police that sets that standard, and they're the ones who are able to decide when they can engage in that level of surveillance. As, as Sharon mentioned briefly, there is that other step, of course, of judicial authorization, and um, you know, I think she had somewhat harsh words for the JP in that case, and I think there is some truth to that. Uh, I think the reality is we have to wonder whether or not our judiciary, and whether or not generally our bar, in criminal defense especially, um, is, is really up to the high level of knowledge that they need to be to understand what the, what the implications of this level of surveillance is. Um, for a lawyer or for a judge to be able to authorize the use of a, uh, a Stingray device, there hasn't been that consequential and that in-depth analysis. And I think one of the problems with our judicial system too when we talk about warrants is that warrants themselves are inherently secret. We don't get to see a judge's decision on why a warrant was issued in this case or that. We don't get to appeal that decision. We don't get to take that to the Supreme Court of Canada and ask the Supreme Court of Canada whether or not a judge's decision was reasonable. There are other ways to get around that and have that discussion, but for the most part, the application for a warrant is one of the only parts of the justice system that is kept entirely secretive. And it's kept secretive, of course, from the individual and from the, uh, the lawyers that might support that individual. And, and I guess in some respects it's not surprising that some of the, the leading cases that have talked about this uh, are coming from organized crime, which are typically individuals that have the ability to hire lawyers mm -hmm. and to really battle. From our perspective at Pivot Legal Society, we represent a specific group of people who typically does not have access to lawyers. And they might be on the receiving end of, of police information or surveillance, but they're not going to have the ability to challenge it without support. So the last thing that I want to talk about, and I guess to, to impart on you and to think about as we ask this ultimate question, where do we draw that line? Um, we actually have to talk about the philosophies of policing and, and the philosophies of what our police force is meant to be doing and how they should be focusing their time. Over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a significant shift in the, the philosophy that underlines policing from what you would argue is a reactive type of policing, where if a uh, event happens, someone calls 911, the police come and respond to it, to what the police would term as proactive policing. Proactive policing was, was really advanced, I think, in the eastern United States, uh, and you might have heard it in terms of something called the broken windows theory. And the idea around proactive policing is that the police should be proactively doing as much as they can to prevent crime from happening. Uh, it's a great concept. In reality, over the last 10 or 15 years, though, unfortunately, we've seen some of the negative side effects of that. Uh, most notably in Toronto, that discussion is resolved around uh, profiling and, and carding. Carding is, is probably the most Canadian example of proactive policing, where police are actively trying to gather information about people in the hopes that it will lead to 
prevention of crime. But it has an impact. It has an impact on individuals' relationship with police. It has an impact on uh, everyone's perception of, of what the police are actually after. And it has the ultimate impact on what police's purpose is in our society. Are they primarily a police service who is there to respond and to help you? Or are they actively investigating in the way that typically we've, we've seen from our national security agencies? There was, um, you know, I'll say that the, the speech last night by, by Chief Justice Joyal was, I thought was very, very fascinating. I actually really look forward to, to bringing it back to our office in Vancouver and talking about some of the things that were said and those interpretations of the charter. Um, one of the things that he did say, though, was that mistrust of the government is something that's somewhat un-Canadian. And when he said that, I thought of two different things. First, I thought about how this philosophy of policing that largely has come up from the United States has had an impact on that. And I really do think that it's, it's changed to some degree the, the Canadian philosophies of policing. And when we talk about mistrust of the government, we also have to remember that not everyone is, is necessarily equal uh, in terms of our society. There are individuals and groups in our society that have mistrust of the government at a much higher level. And that mistrust isn't necessarily philosophically based, but it's based on the fact that they are actually on the receiving end of continual um, surveillance or interactions with police. And when we talk about carding in Toronto, that's a great example. Um, we represent and we deal with a lot of, of different groups, especially First Nations groups, African Canadians. And I think it should be acknowledged, I guess, that for a lot of those people, their mistrust of the government on police is based in their own personal experience. And we have to remember that these surveillance tools, these philosophies of policing, uh, more and more we're realizing just the profound effect it can have on certain members of our society. So all of those things, I would suggest, need to be taken into account when we ultimately answer that question over the next five or ten years, which is where do we draw the line? Uh, probably we should acknowledge and, and admit that uh, surveillance is going to be a reality for us, that the government is going to have access to this information. The question is how and when. And if you really want to try to prevent these kind of egregious privacy breaches, the best way to do that is not necessarily to set a rule and hope that the government responds to it, but to try to ingrain in the, in the government itself, in police forces, those kind of philosophies that actually protect our rights. Um, ideally, you want a police force that says, well, we could conduct surveillance or we could access this information, but that would be wrong. That would be against the rules of the Charter and that would be against this individual's privacy rights. Uh, and, and to really get there, I think we have to have those deep discussions about where people feel like their rights need to be protected. Um, at the moment, I don't think those discussions are happening. And, and in that void, in that vacuum, uh, typically the police will step in and write those rules themselves and not everyone is going to be kind of on the winning side there. So um, I hope I've left a little bit of time for questions. Um, not sure if I did. Close, maybe very quickly. Um, I'd love to hear some thoughts on this and, and where people, um, I guess, have seen, um, if you have read these kind of articles or if you have any thoughts about where you think that that line should be drawn or how we could effectively deal with these questions. Uh, now, this is very interesting to me because uh, when I hear about devices like this, I think there's been a lot of clear judicial statements about the constitutionality of these sorts of uh, privacy issues. Like, for instance, here's one from the Court of Appeal here in Ontario. Personal privacy is about more than secrecy and confidentiality. Privacy is about being left alone by the state and not being liable to be called to account for everything and anything that one does, says, or thinks. Personal privacy protects an individual's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis within society while enjoying a degree of anonymity that is essential to an individual's personal growth and flourishing in an open and democratic society. And the persistent surveillance, to me, seems to be rather uh, contrary to that, uh, that comment by the Court of Appeal here. And even back in 1992, our Supreme Court said this. This is rather a prophetic moment, perhaps, from the Supreme Court. In this, 1992, in this explosive era of technology, it, can be, it can't be long before a device is developed that will be able to track every moment, every movement for indefinite periods of time, even without visual surveillance. We owe our, to our statutory protection. Oh, so then the court goes on. But you can see that this, is, this has long been before the courts. And it's always been puzzling to me how uh, devices such as Sting Stingray could uh, ever pass constitutional merit or a challenge. And it's very interesting, even if you get on Canley, students, if you get on Canley and look up uh, some of the recent cases on, on uh, Stingray, 
you'll see that most of the case is redacted. In Canley, you just end up with a bunch of black bars across, this, uh, across the case because uh, the police have successfully, at least up to this point, shielded, shielded uh, releasing their information to the public. But I think, now correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the, in the summer or early spring, someone in the UK actually leaked the manual for the Stingray device and put it online. And so it, now it's everywhere. Um, and uh, it's very fascinating. I, I talked with a member of the criminal bar here when that happened, and he was at that point asking, asking the police to have to disclose his information, was getting nowhere. So he found it online, which is quite interesting. So I would, if there's any questions, we'd love to have you ask the panelists. The mic's right here. Yeah, so I guess I just wonder, the Cessna device, the, the, the plane in Baltimore, and by the way, there's a really great Radio Lab podcast about it that goes through the narrative. It's a very liberal-leaning podcast, but as they go through both sides, the hosts become convinced that the Cessna device is good when they find out that it prevented a murder. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty hard to disagree with that. So I guess my general question is, is there any turning back? Do we need to come to a break? Rush with totalitarianism. Um, I used to be a criminal defense lawyer, um, and it's been, you know, just palpably jarring to me how once you're outside of the context of criminal defense counsel co conferences, there is just such a strong momentum to, you know, defend police practices that save human lives and that are important for security. Um, so, what do you think it would take beyond a philosophical shift, which might be weak gruel, to be honest? Yeah. No, it's, it's a really important thing to remember is that, you know, whenever we talk about these kind of surveillance devices and systems, the police can always make a very good argument for why they need them. And, and definitely, and I, I listened to that podcast as well, and I definitely recommend it. I think, um, you know, the reality is if the devices are being used in the appropriate way, they can be an incredibly effective tool. The problem, of course, with that is, is that at the moment, police have the complete monopoly in deciding when's appropriate and, and when it's effective. Um, and I think one of the, the, one of the natural checks on these types of devices has been they take time and effort, and they take human resources, and they take you know, the ability to, to process the information. As we get further and further down the line and that becomes less of an issue, then we have to start asking those questions. Um, is it appropriate for the police to be using a Cessna airplane or a Stingray device to, to track down a 16-year-old that's stolen a candy bar from a store? Um, that's a very different question than it is for is it appropriate for the police to use those devices to try to track down and determine who just committed a murder. And unfortunately, I think that's the level of discourse that has been missing. Um, and, and that kind of idea of when is it serious enough or when is it important enough to allow police access to that. Because there's always going to be examples of when it is important enough and when it's absolutely vital for that police have access to that information, those devices. So um, I, that's why I would say, you know, at this point there are people who are trying to push and say, well, these devices should not be used. Um, we need to turn, turn back the clock a bit and not allow this kind of intrusion into our lives. I think that day is pretty much done. And, and I think it's probably, and maybe you can talk about that a bit, Sharon, but I think, um, you know, the reality is uh, the, the real question now is, is not necessarily that these things should or should not be used, but, but trying to set the appropriate guidelines and also the accountability measures. Um, at the end of the day, if police don't have adequate accountability, uh, they're going to be very less motivated, I guess, to, to protect the interests of privacy and innocent people. So. I'll add a little bit to that. As I recall, the police in Baltimore, they employed the Cessna surveillance device, and it was long after the fact that city council found out about it, and they got approval. So they were loose cannons. They were doing what they wanted because the technology was there, and so much money has been given to so many American police departments to arm themselves in the name of national defense national security, they can do it because it's available. And as Doug said, it's, the technology itself is not the problem. We are. It's what we do with or to the technology, how we use it. What's the motivation? What's the purpose? And what's the outcome? The, this kind of idea that the means, just, uh, the ends justify the means is not a new uh, or, or solely related to criminal stuff. We see this right across government now. Um, in There's just no kind of philosophical or critical thinking from a lot of bureaucrats around what can be justified depending on the specific outcome. And you know, whether that be like um, vision zero, we want zero pedestrian accidents in the entire city. 
and we do whatever it takes to have no accidents, you know, short of like cars made of foam. Um, but the, the question for me would be, um, is this a matter of policy or is this really just a technological war? Because I don't think previous, I don't think previous governments would have not done this had they had the ability. You know, I don't think the, the governments of the 50s or the 60s would have turned down the opportunity to read everybody's letters had they had the ability to see through the envelopes and read every single letter had they had the ability. And so the question isn't, has the policy changed such that we now allow this to happen? It's that they have the ability to do so. And so is the response to develop technologies that, to prevent them from doing so? So the specific question would be how effective is things like encryption and encrypted devices and encrypted communications against some of these t uh, devices like the, um, uh, the Stingray and things like that? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll let you take one part of it. I, I did recently read, and I'm not an expert in this by any means, but it, I think one thing that's always important to remember is that one of the most leading uh, you know, computer scientists and, and kind of the most uh, prolific um, people who could engage in hacking, they all say at some point they probably take a contract to work for the government. Um, and there's not that kind of divide, I think, in that world of like government, non-government. Um, so I, I've always had severe doubts of whether or not, you know, things like encryption or whether or not uh, technology to battle that kind of surveillance would be effective. At the end of the day, um, the governments typically have access to that regardless of, of kind of who is on the other side. And I would add that what you're talking about has been going on for a very long time. It might just be that the technology not only has allowed the police and the state to up their game, it's given us a way of demanding a bit of accountability and leaking information, whether it's through Assange's or anybody. We find out now, because the communication channels are open to us as well, but the mail, the, a photo is taken of the face of every piece of mail, has been for a long time. That goes into a database. It's all happening. We're just finding out about it now. And the laws are being changed, like C-51, to make it legal. Because people are starting to say, don't do it. It's not legal. So they're making laws to make it legal. <laughs>